microphone on. Options are sort of working. So we're just better than nothing. <laughs> Captions should hopefully work now. No, oh, I have to enable them. All right. Yes, mysterious voices. <laughs> I think we're ready now. Perfect. Let's go. Oh, I can fix that. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to try and uh, adjust the height on this camera real quick. Um, How is everybody? Welcome to Archival Adventures. I hope that you're having a great day. Um, as you can see, I have a guest today. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, I am, of course, Anthony Wright J. Hernandez, uh, known in some places on Twitch as Rogan27. I'm the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And this is Archival Adventures, uh, where we take a look at things in the collections and just, you know, generally learn. Uh, so today I am joined by um, curator Jenny yeah, hi. Uh, from the Christiansburg Institute. Um, do you want to do a little intro? Sure. Um, I'm Jenny Nairt. I'm the curator at Christiansburg Institute, Inc. So I help manage the Christiansburg Institute Museum and Archives and our Christiansburg Institute Digital Archives. And it's my first time on Twitch, so I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Yay. Uh, Okay, let's, I, I'm just going to say hi to the people in chat real quick. Uh, Lord Portico, it is great to see you. Uh, and Key Squared, here with my hands full fixing something, but made it nonetheless. Hey, we're happy to have you. Um, Shadows of Life, hello, hello. Uh, of course, yes, uh, the Rogue Ship one is reminding everybody, please participate in chat if you want to be randomly selected as a VIP for the stream. It doesn't give big prizes, but it's fun anyway. Uh, <laughs> so it's good to see all of you. Um, welcome, we're weird, but harmless. Sure. I appreciate that, thank you. <laughs> we don't fight through the um, internet. Hi, uh, Alex, it's good to see you. Welcome. Alex. <laughs> Hi, Alex. Um, of course, we are streaming to two channels. Uh, the twitch.tv slash btul studios as well as twitch.tv slash rogan27 so there is a chance um that we'll be responding to chat in the other channel uh and oh gosh steven joyce hello hello <laughs> team weird but harmless thank you so much for the 33 month free subscription um well let's uh let's get this going and and see what we're gonna do today um i, I have to look far to the side. So you're going to see a lot of the side of my face today, but it's fine. Uh, as always, we're going to start. Hi, Fluidan! <laughs> and Puddle Glove, it's good to see you too. Um, we are going to start, as always, with the Land Acknowledgement and Labor Recognition uh, from Virginia Tech, because that's where we are today. Um, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tulo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Moral Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands and Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude plantations owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olney Institute, and they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Atrosin, that I may serve, in the spirit of community diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. And hi, Hannah. Thanks for dropping the uh, 
UT acknowledges in the Anthony chat. Um, all right, so let's let's talk about what we're going to look at today. Uh, as you can see from the um, the title, the stream episode title, uh, we're looking at the Christiansburg Institute today. Um, do you want to yes. do you want to talk uh, a little about uh, what is the Christiansburg Institute? What part of the website should we look at to just get background? Sure. So we should we can always start with our mission statement. Uh, so Christiansburg Institute Inc. We are a grassroots nonprofit with a mission of community empowerment. Or I'm sorry, community education, intergenerational empowerment, and the responsible stewardship of African American history in Southwest Virginia. So we are a museum that preserves a museum and archives that preserves the history of Christiansburg Institute and the incredible, incredibly rich surrounding African American history in Southwest Virginia. Uh, Christiansburg Institute was a school for African Americans that started right after the Civil War in 1866, founded initially as a Freedmen's Bureau School, uh, meaning it received some government funding, funding through reconstruction, um, and it lasted 100 years until it closed in 1966, generating thousands of African Americans, both locally as well as uh, students who came from across the country to learn at Christiansburg Institute. Um, stay in the boarding halls and uh, learn under the Tuskegee method in Southwest Virginia. Okay. And Hannah, thanks for the heads up that the music was a bit loud. I have adjusted that. Um, so there are various collections available on your website, right? Yes. So we were awarded through a grant in partnership with Virginia Tech Libraries, um, a Council on Library and Information Resources Grant Digitizing Hidden Collections, where we were able to digitize um, all of our rich archives that are in our archive in Christiansburg, um, which is available on Catalog It right now, and will soon be available through Virginia Tech's digital libraries by the end of this grant period, which is just in a couple of months. It's a little slow sometimes. <laughs> A lot of content. We'll give, we'll give a it a minute. A lot of content. <laughs> yeah. So this grant um, allowed for the digitization of about 52,000 individual pages, uh, ranging from photographs to manuscripts, uh, catalogs, um, really a lot of incredible artifacts that speak to life at Christiansburg Institute. Awesome. Uh, All right. Let's, I'm just going to... Yeah, there it is. There we go. <laughs> so this is the digitized stuff that... Uh, if you're not local, um, you would be able to take a look at, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and since we're still finishing out this project, but most of what we've digitized is available by now. Um, and we have several other grants for uh, to continue digitizing because we have more in our collection that we want to make accessible to everybody. That's um, awesome. Yeah. The history of the school is really interesting because it closed in 66. Um, and at that point, it had become a private, I'm sorry, a public school managed by the local uh, school system. So when the school closed, it was essentially government property and divided and sold at public auction. And much of what was at the physical school, the artifacts, photos, documents, was either absorbed into the various school systems, because CI at that time was uh, managed by a joint board of supervisors or a joint board of control. Um, from Floyd County, Montgomery County, Giles County, and Bradford City. Okay. Um, so when school closed, basically all the artifacts were either destroyed or sent into these different school systems where they were later um, basically just worked through. So what we have done for the past, well, alumni have been gathering since the 70s, these artifacts, um, and have been working to preserve their history. Um, and in the past 10 years, we've really focused on increasing our stewardship and our care of these artifacts because um, everything used to be in a storage unit um, until about seven years ago. So of okay. course that's not accessible if it's in a storage unit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So what is, what I'm showing now is um, this is our finding aid for the collection that we have here at Virginia Tech. Um, I believe a lot of this collection is actually photocopies of the originals that they have. Uh, but for a long time, that was the only way people could access it. 
Mm -hmm. um, I love that it's available uh, through you now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have a note here that was an administrative history or like history note uh, to go with the finding aid written by the, um, whoever processed this collection, I don't know. Uh, Laura Katz Smith, um, whenever this was processed, I don't, I don't know, but I'm just gonna read this and just get a little background. You can correct me on anything that is incorrect and then um, I'll have the record that I can use to update the finding aid. <laughs> Hi, Sterling. Um, the Christiansburg Industrial Institute was founded in 1866 in Cambria, now Christiansburg, Virginia, by Civil War Union Captain Charles S. Schaefer as a private primary school for uh, African-American children um, through the support of the Friends Freedmen's Association in Philadelphia, a Quaker organization. Schaefer received financial backing for the school. In 1896, Booker T. Washington molded the program to one that would emphasize technical training for uh, African-American people. Um, a 185-acre farm was purchased as the school's campus in 1905. And in 1934, the Montgomery County School Board began its management of the school. Uh, CII was converted in 1947 to a regional high school for African-American students and closed in 1966 when local schools were integrated. Yeah, so pretty on the dot except for school campus. Okay. Uh, they purchased that in 1898, I believe. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, this is, this is all true. Um, CII was founded and I can, we can start looking at yeah, that. I, yeah, that's, don't have to listen to me. <laughs> We can we can see the history uh, wherever it is, whatever. Um, Absolutely. Right? <laughs> yes, yes, Sterling. Uh, I will have Sterling fix it. <laughs> In Thank fact, you, Sterling. Uh, the correction of the date could be fixed live right now if you've got time, but you don't have to do it right now. <laughs> yes. We will not. All right. Let's look at an early catalog. This is from the 20s. So I shouldn't say early catalog because technically it's six, uh, 60 years after the school started. But there we go. There's a button to make it there. Awesome. <laughs> so this is a good example of you can glimpse into what life was like at CI in the 20s. So Here's that shout out to the Friends Freedmen's Association of Philadelphia. These are the um, the Quaker I, philanthropic I group. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So they, after, um, see, I started as a Freedmen's Bureau of School through government money, but um, the United States pretty quickly abandons the goal of reconstruction within a decade. So by 72, there's really no government money to support the school. So Charles Schaefer, himself being from Philadelphia, um, is already familiar with this group, and he reaches out and contacts them um, for additional financial support. And it's through this group that um, we that CI becomes attached to Booker T. Washington, because they reach out to him. This is pretty grainy, <laughs> but you can imagine uh, this is a class photograph of students gathered in front of Bailey Morris Hall. This is the girls' dormitory. Um, and it was actually a four and a half story uh, Georgian brick campus. And I always like to point that out because even today, um, if you're driving around our local town and you're not looking at Virginia Tech, um, we don't have a lot of really big and impressive brick buildings like that. So for the African-American community to have built this um, is really impressive. I feel like I've seen a picture like that on your website yeah i'm trying to figure out where though <laughs> the website changes so much i can look you can you can okay. talk to documents if i find it i will i will share Great. <laughs> so calendar what was this like so school year started september 9th and it continued through june 2nd pretty similar and at this point it Abraham Walker is the principal. He is the last Tuskegee trained principal um, at CI. Um, from, let's see, 18, about 1878 um, to uh, the end of 
Walker's time, which is in the 40s, um, there was a Tuskegee trained um, principal sort of guiding Christiansburg Institute to ensure that it's following the methodology Booker T. Washington created. Um, let's see. So by this point, Booker T. Washington has passed on, and Robert R. Moton, who was another um, leading uh, leading um, ed African American educator, um, he was involved in the military. He went abroad um, and surveyed uh, the um, how would you say it? the conditions of the military for African American soldiers um, throughout World War II, World War One, pardon, and World War II, I believe. So very. Um, nationally recognized person who also had connections down here i found some various photographs yeah. uh i don't know that i have exactly that Do one but i'd love to shout out this one that you're sure. pulling up um also congratulations uh alex on being um selected randomly as the vip for the stream alex is always the vip <laughs> my heart <laughs> so this photo is um I Sorry. Yes. Uh, yes, Sterling. I meant to tag you. <laughs> also, a big key squared notes. Uh, they've met the librarian who managed the archives that has the Friends Freedmen's Association papers. That's uh, work for. I am jealous. I have not gotten up there yet, but it's um, it is absolutely on my to do list. That would be incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so this photo um, that you were kind enough to pull up, I always like to point to the white man in the center is Charles Schaefer. Um, but the men surrounding him are the first board of deacons for the first African Baptist church, which is a structure that still survives today next to the Hill School on High Street in Christiansburg. Um, and it shows you that while a lot of, especially um, the historical narrative around CI has traditionally been about Charles Schaefer, um, this uh, Friedman's uh, bureau worker who came down and started schools and churches and did wonderful things, all of which is true. Um, but there's so much more to this history than just that one story, because alongside of him was an entire community of African-American leaders, men, women, who were also shaping the school, building it and fundraising. So they were in lockstep with, you know, Charles Schaefer and the Friends Friedman's Association in creating the school for themselves. So, um, Cambria at the time was primarily an African American community. Was it similar to like Newtown and Blacksburg? No, it was um. So it was a its own town. It's until it was known as Bangs originally, and then renamed. Um, and if you look on a map, it's really funny. It's almost like a donut that goes around Christiansburg. Mm -hmm. So it's like the more rural parts, or at least what would have been considered more rural back in the day. Sorry, we should we should talk to the cameras. Sorry. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but keep going. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, if you look at the map, it's really like a little donut around. And because um, I always wondered, because if you are familiar with Christiansburg today and where the historic campus is, it's and I hate to use this as our uh, lo locating um, icon, but it's behind the Dairy Queen. <laughs> so, and it ran from that location. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, all the way to the 460 interchange, so almost 200 acres. Um, so big, big school. Um, it's but, weird to me that it opened it. Wait up, wait up. I would like. Um, if you want our website, that's what I want. Okay. Uh, I was just like trying to open a map, and I was like, why is it doing it this way? Um, Dudes. Oh, trying to figure out where I am. Yeah, <laughs> I think you gotta go that way. <laughs> this way. Yeah. There's the Montgomery Museum, and then we should be up and across from that Kroger. Yeah. Yeah, and the Aquatic Center, we're, right across. We're getting over towards. Uh, I think where I actually live now would have been part of Cambria. So right where that railroad track is, um, mm -hmm. is the base of the school. So we have reports the students came by railroad because um, they were coming, well, most of the students came from local, the local New River Valley. Um, we did have students, like I said earlier, who came from Northern cities, Kentucky Coalfields, even a student who attended from Jamaica, which 
is very far. That is, <laughs> yeah, I I just knew it as like a regional. Yeah, and because of all these national connections, um, I think the Booker T. Washington and the Robert Rose Rusa Moten connection. Um, also behind the, the Dairy Queen, behind the behind <laughs> the beautiful Dairy Queen. Check it out and get an ice cream cone. Or not. I don't I just get paid by that, Dairy Queen. I just know that if you turn on Scattergood, yes. that'll head towards where you are. But I don't actually know where you physically are. Yes. So that is where the historic location is. Okay. Um, our physical offices are off-site at 125 Arrowhead uh, on a different part of town. <laughs> but so this was where the yes. school was located. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it had about 14 substantial brick buildings. Dormitories for boys and girls, students, uh, professors, teachers lived on campus. Um, Anna Long, who came, she was amongst the first of the Tuskegee graduates to come and um, help reshape CI. Um, if you want to. I was going to pull up one of the class photos. Yeah, that would be great. What's that one? Is she in that? I don't think so. I don't but, know. This is 44. Trying to see if I could zoom in, but yeah. If you just want to flip through them, I'm sure I could probably smaller. But yeah, um, so Anna Long came in about 1896, I believe, with um, Charles Marshall and um, Edgar Long, who she would marry. Her maiden name was Patterson, um, and they met at CI, fell in love, got married. Char uh, Edgar Long actually. Uh, died in 27 and she continued to live another 30 years on CI's campus as the matron in the girls dormitory so there were a lot of people who dedicated their entire lives to it um Ooh. yeah there we go Cal we've got a calfy one yeah. uh and this is partly why we say <laughs> you know we preserve the history a more general history of um african-american history in southwest virginia because it's so connected. It's all so connected. So, uh, Calfee was a theater school. Mm -hmm. um, Calfee, uh, located in Pulaski, Virginia. Um, it's a, another school for African American youth, uh, but was a theater school to Christiansburg Institute. And um, Calfee, actually, I've been I've been working with them on um, a project to create a community center with a museum and uh, uh, other services, uh, daycare, community center, museum, archives, um, related to the the Calfi school. Um, so I, when I saw Calfi in your photos here, I, I wanted to click on it. Yeah. Um... <laughs> yes, thank you, Alex, for dropping that link to the, um, the Calfi Community and Cultural Center. Awesome. Yeah, they're doing such great work. Um, cross talk that over to the other chat. So, <laughs> um, we call her our patron saint of the archives, Amanda D. Hart, who we have another one, a collection of hers. Um, she's from Pulaski and um, was somewhat involved in uh, the Calfi School. And she herself was really instrumental in the gathering of all the archives that we have. So, and this is a reflection of our community's interest too. She was also interested in healthy and local African yeah. American history beyond CI. So we have a lot of, in our collection that maybe isn't specific to CI, but is informs that history. Yeah. And yeah, I, why would you limit it? It's the school was part of the community, so mm -hmm. why wouldn't you? Just collect everything about the community. Yeah, absolutely. It all helps tell a story. Um, let's see. So, some more photos. Um, industrial building, and inside we have an exterior shot. A little hard to see, but um, this is the science laboratory. These are wooden benches going across it. Um, and this was, um, when we talk about the Tuskegee method, we're talking about um, this idea that Booker T. Washington's philosophy that African-Americans can achieve greater equality through economic equality, um, education that provides them a future career path so they can support themselves and their families and their communities with the idea, idea that, you know, my money is as green as yours, regardless of racism and uh, discrimination. 
Um, this is a very um, controversial idea for some. Um, and at CI, we see sort of, we see uh, Washington's idea of the Tuskegee method being implemented, but at a very um, almost nuanced way. And be really interested to learn how it was done at other schools. Um, and that, you know, they never dropped the standards of um, reading, writing, arithmetic, all the traditional things that you assume. But on top of that, they also had to learn like the real science behind, behind agriculture, um, how to make bricks, printing. Um, if you could really, there's so much you could specialize in. Because it was uh, industrial? Focus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was looking to, uh, Sterling noted photographs were interested in here. I wasn't sure if maybe we had some. And on top of it being, you know. Less, less photocopy <laughs> and more original. Oh, this is really cool too. <laughs> uh, on top of the, you know, intense um, curriculum, they also had a thriving like social aspect of the school. Um, because it was a regional school, um, alumni like Miss Debbie who Debbie Sherman Lee, who is um, our chairwoman of the board, and she attended school for at CI for eighth grade in nineteen sixty six, right before it closed. Um, she talks about how when you went there, it was really like a gathering place for the African American Af African American community in the New River Valley. Because, you know, for a lot of people, especially children, they didn't have the means to necessarily go in between Pulaski, Giles, Radford, and Christiansburg. So the football games and community dances um, were all places where people could gather and organize and talk to each other. Um, so they had a thriving sports program, football, basketball, uh, majorettes, marching bands. Um, love these pennant flags because it's also you know we talk about all these heavy things about racism and prejudice and being denied access to educational opportunities but at the same time they were also children going to school mm -hmm. you know being thrilled when you know they pummeled each other at football too like it's all about the balancing the story <laughs> do you know who they played sure so they could only play african-american teams um and it was in the 50s, so they mostly played each other, local schools, but in the 50s, they helped this program throughout the state called the Virginia Interscholastic uh, Association, and it was formed through Virginia State University, which is um, a HBCU, and um, they, basically it was a statewide initiative so that they would have schools to play. Different African-American schools could compete against each other in sports. Mm -hmm and academics and things like that because there was a white version of that which of course the students weren't allowed to participate in yeah so uh hbcu in case anybody doesn't know is um historically back historically black colleges and universities mm -hmm. um so uh virginia state university is also a land grant institution it's the uh the counterpart to virginia tech virginia tech was white only virginia state was uh, the black um yeah, the uh, counterpart, essentially, yeah. since uh, Virginia Tech was a land grant school. Thank you. Land grant, the words that I had said a few minutes before, left my brain. I can only remember because you weren't asking <laughs> me specifically. <laughs> but, yeah, it was the equivalent, you know, that's separate but equal. Um, words are hard, yes. Words are hard. Um, should we look at, let's take a look at some of the clippings in the, um, the vertical pile. I think those could be interesting. I have no idea what's in it, but <laughs> we could look at the scrapbook if it's in box three, two, uh, at some point, if you want, but For this one, yeah, it seems like we have a lot of newspaper clippings. Um, Ooh. and I, so I have no idea what's in here, but this is, uh, one of our vertical files. And so if you're unfamiliar with like archiving and, um, that a vertical file is, this is a newspaper clippings file is what it is. Um, there's a topical subject and over the years, um, people like an archivist has gone through and clipped out any stories related to the various topics that we are collecting um, and just put them into a folder. So this is part of our um, Montgomery County vertical files. 
uh, and we have a folder on Christiansburg Institute. Yeah. So I saw someone mention that it's by Brewed Bean, which is a coffee shop in Christiansburg. Uh -huh. So this gymnasium right here is actually the same building that Brewed Bean is in, um, same Grace Life Church. So there's two structures that still exist today from the farm campus. Um, one being the Edgar A. Long building, which is in this photo. This John F. Banks, the last principal of CI, standing in front of it. Um, and to the right of it is Bailey Morris Hall, the girls' dormitory. Um, and then in this photo, we see students leaving the newly constructed uh, gymnasium building. It was built in 54. Um, and these were, like I said, the two that still remain today. Um, and though the gymnasium is a separate business now. Mm -hmm. um, but you could still go inside today. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah. So this gymnasium, um, on top of it being a gymnasium, was also a classroom building. Ooh. Oh, I think this is the photo we're tr maybe trying to find I think here. That looks like it's a pamphlet of some yeah. sort. Yeah. So this is a pamphlet from a Century of Contribution, which was an exhibit that was done in the early thousands. I think perhaps definitely held a reception at tech libraries. Um, and then the photo that they chose for this pamphlet is about 1920s, um, and it's Bailey Morris Hall again. Um, you can see the girls in their dresses up front. Um, this might actually be a te summer teacher school institute. Mm -hmm. So on top of it being um, a school for everyday children, there was also a real need for black teachers, um, trained teachers. Uh, so CI um, and Edgar Long wrote a lot of Edgar Long, the principal, wrote a lot of um, advertisements in newspapers saying, come to our teacher's retreat in the beautiful Appalachian Mountains. It's not hot. The air is clean. You won't catch cholera. I mean, you know, the, that, last, the cholera I'm throwing in, point. but I think it was hinted at. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so on top of training students, they are also training, you know, the next generation of teachers that would impact um, schools across the whole state. Mm -hmm. This is a great photograph. Um, you'd call it this folder. Um, this is a super clear photo of Booker T. Washington when he spoke on campus on July 25th, 1909. And this was part of his um, Southern education tour. So he got on the train and basically rode through the South, um, stopping at various points. So on this trip, he stopped in Harrisburg, Christiansburg, where he spoke in front of Bailey Morris, I'm sorry, Morris Hall. This is the boys' dormitory. Okay. Um, and in the newspaper article that was published at the same time, they say that a crowd of three to 5,000, a widely different number. Um, we, we could have. Oh, I, yeah. I have no idea if, if it'll go back that far, but you can yeah. keep telling the story. I'm just sure. going to poke around and see what we've got. Yeah, three to five thousand people um, came to hear him speak. An interracial crowd coming from Roanoke and through the country. Um, former uh, former Virginia Governor Hogue also was there. I think it was Tyler Hogue, um, as well as several ex-Confederate soldiers who were pretty notable in Montgomery County. Um, this, this was a real. There was. Hmm, how should I phrase this? By 1909, I think the general, the community had come to accept CI more. They didn't see it quite as dangerous as when Charles Schaefer first came after the Civil War. Um, when he first came in 1865, there was actually a violence, um, threat, violent threats against him. There, he said that he was shot through the cap, it went right through. Um, and, you know, we know also, ooh, and nudge the table. It happens. <laughs> and we also know from um, reports that uh, the African American community, when they had services um, in the first African Baptist church, um, they came armed because they didn't feel very safe. Um, but by 1909, I think there was a more acceptance of Booker uh, T. Washington and the Tuskegee Method, what was being done at Christiansburg Institute. Um, about 10 years after this photo was taken, there's going to be um, an interracial board that comes together to fundraise and um, open the Christiansburg Institute Hospital. 
on CI's campus. Um, it's short lived, but it shows that there is um, community effort. In fact, um, I think it's Eggleston, Virginia Tech president uh, Eggleston was on that hospital committee. So, you know, there's real support and acknowledgement that there's need here. Um, this is cute. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just pulling things out that look interesting. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is, what is this? Let's find out. Um, Christiansburg Institute Community Center and Landmark Committee. So a little thank you letter. Um, and on it is this beautiful sketch of the Hill School. So this is um, the building that they occupied before they moved to the farm campus. Really beautiful. And you also see, um, sometimes it's called Christiansburg Industrial Institute. Mm -hmm. The name changed several times throughout its school or I throughout think, its life. Uh, this one talks about, it has various names in it. Yeah. Oh yeah, Anna. <laughs> Yeah, it worked pretty hard for a long time helping tell the story. So yeah, you went through Christiansburg Normal School, meaning that they were training teachers, mm -hmm. Christiansburg Normal and Industrial Institute, which is when they then shifted from training teachers to also this industrial curriculum where they learned things um, from farming, um, agri so farming, agriculture, uh, printing, blacksmithing, construction. Um, of course, it's gendered. So if you were um, a woman, they... Had you learning cooking, um, sewing, uh, laundry, which was a major employer in this area. It's not an exciting necessarily idea, but um, that's how a lot of local African-American families made their money, especially women. Um, and then they drop normal and it's Christiansburg Industrial Institute. And then when it becomes a public school and they drop the industrial curriculum and it really just looks like a pretty typical high school, mm -hmm. um, it becomes Christiansburg Institute. I was poking around. This is pre-1959, so it's going to have a little bit of uh, language in it that we would not use today. But uh, oh, I can zoom in a little bit so people can see it better. Um, it looked interesting. I just was skimming it a little bit. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and if uh, I hit the focus. Hopefully it will focus enough that you can read it up there. I can also make adjustments if necessary. Yeah, I can. Or you can read directly from the document too. <laughs> sure. Uh, Regional High School for African Americans in Christiansburg, now in the news. Of course, I'm changing language from Negroes to African Americans to mm -hmm. be more common or contemporary. Um, now is the news because the suit in federal court is to integrate the white high school at Floyd is an institution of no of no means standing in educational circles with background history of extraordinary interest so they're alluding to a court case that happened i think in the late 40s i don't know um but corbin v pulaski um in which case uh chrissy corbin was a african-american doctor in pulaski county um, and his student came to Christiansburg Institute and Percy or Dr. Corbin um, sues Pulaski County um, schools, basically saying it's everybody equal is not equal. Um, students in Pulaski County probably had the worst commute and that it was 30 miles each way. Um, they had to get to the bus station too, which is I, for many of us who grew up in a rural area knows that that's not easy necessarily. Um, they also allege, and we see this is, we see, um, complaints of this in the, uh, minutes in the school board, uh, that the school has not really been kept up very well when this, uh, Montgomery County school board took over. Um, the school is old at that point in the 50, by 50, it's over 50 years old. Um, so the buildings need some repair and there's continual asks in the minutes for funding to make these repairs that are almost always denied or, you know, it's, they do stopgap solutions that work in the short term. Mm -hmm. So Percy, uh, Dr. Corbin um, alleges that it's too far. It's not fair. Uh, the conditions aren't good. He even says that one student caught pneumonia because the boiler was not working and um, passed away. 
which is horrible. Um, but yeah. believable. Yeah, believable. Um, also, just because this is wild, yeah. students drove the bus often. Students were driving the buses from Pulaski to, um, to Christiansburg and Christiansburg to Wake Forest and Floyd as well. So uh, those are not nearby. No. That that is a long distance. <laughs> a very long distance. Um, so this is September of fifty-nine and uh it was right around nineteen fifty-nine when a lot of Virginia schools shut down rather than integrate. Um what happened here? Like I know I know what happened at the Moton School. Yes. But I don't know what happened here. Yeah, it's interesting. Um so when Virginia says that what is the language in um Ground B board, it's they will integrate in all due time, something like that, meaning that they didn't put an official deadline on integration in the school system. So Virginia, through Harry Bird and his, um, i trying to think of a nice word, but there's no nice word for Harry Bird. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like you were going to say cronies, which I, I think is an entirely appropriate I was, term. it's cronies, yeah. Uh, uh, you're right, why am I, why am I being <laughs> sent in by Harry Bird? Um, anyway, his cronies. Um, enter a phase called massive resistance where it's better if we just shut down all the schools rather than um integrate because a lot of um white students were able to go to private schools that's how a lot of our private schools that exist today were founded but anyway um ci is different uh, montgomery county pulaski county they don't do that um i think partly because there's smaller african-american population um for, I, but there's probably a lot more reasons that we could explore that um, I don't think the historical research has been done fully yet. Um, so instead of shutting down, uh, CI stays open and instead slowly integrates. So I believe Pulaski County is the first to integrate in 63. Um, uh, so I pulled up the, um, this is the website for the Moton Museum, uh, which is um, the Mo Moton High School, um, uh, where it's been turned into a, a museum about, uh, integration of the schools in Virginia, uh, and they have this timeline on here. So Brown, uh, versus the Board of Education decision was in 54, um, Brown 2 wow. in 55. Uh, with all deliberate speed is is the addition for um, round two. Uh, but then in 1959, public schools close. Um, and so this is talking Prince Edward County because that's where Moton was located. But um, I think these decisions were made county by county rather than yeah. the entire state. Um, so our locality chose to keep our schools open and instead they did selective integration. So there were students, uh, I think, Mickey Hickman from Coffee might be one of them he, who did attend CI for a year but actually decided if I'm going to have to integrate I'd rather go do it and maybe be able to create some sort of life for myself in the new school. Um, others chose to stay at CI um, rather than do that. Um, same thing happened in Blacksburg too. Um, students in Blacksburg I think as early as 61 started um, integrating the local school system, um, but it was selective. Um, yeah, it was, took me a second to figure out where it was, but um, there's also uh, this here that people might find interesting. This is a collaborative uh, project. I was going to get rid of the highlight, but I'm not going to because I can't see it well enough. Um, this is a collaborative project. It's currently housed at um, Old Dominion University. Uh, just pointing to all of the documents that have been located related to the desegregation of Virginia education. Um, uh, I've done some of the data entry for um, a few of the items uh, that show up in the database. Um, Anyway, I just thought it would be good to point to this because, again, related topic. 
Um, we have in our collections um, the Montgomery County School Desegregation Plan, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. Um, we have some letters too that were sent to um, to parents, basically saying, you know, this is the last year that they can attend CI. And uh, of course, Virginia Tech um, has a lot of oral histories that were captured. Um, I think Michael Cook. Um, who did a Black and Appalachians uh, oral history series mm -hmm. and a paper. Uh, recorded a lot of really interesting stories that comp captured that complicated nuance of feelings. So this is an awesome aerial photograph of um, CI's historic campus, probably taken right before it closed. Um, so in here you can see this is, I always like to center us. So Edgar uh -huh. Long, um, Bailey Morse Hall, Oh, and then across the hall, we see the gymnasium. So we know it's at least past uh, 50 people work. Um, and then to the back, oh, I'm sorry, forward this way. So at this point, the farm campus, most of it had already been sold off. So they're not including that, though it would have extended backwards. Um, you can see, so this building right here, that is the trades building, but before it became the trades building, um, that was the CI College Hospital. Um, and that's really important, even though it's short lived, it's an important part of CI's history because mm -hmm. it speaks to how they were trying to meet that community need. Um, Edgar Long, in his writings, which you can read, <laughs> I feel like I'm on QVC, you can read um, <laughs> Innovation of Education, Christian Spring Institute. So um, we put out this book a couple years ago, and we have his original writings in our archive. Um, but in 2001, I believe, the first iteration of this came out, um, including his uh, writings. And they talk also about the healthcare system and the rates of disease locally and how African Americans are dying because um, they don't have the care. And in fact, um, Charles Marshall, I'm going to see if I can pull a photo of. Ranged it. I should have to find it. Um, anyway. That doesn't necessarily mean we remember. <laughs> yeah. We understand. Thank you. Um, anyway, in this beautiful book that you can find <laughs> at Virginia Tech Libraries and in the local libraries, um, there's a selection of his writing that talks about the medical statistics locally. Uh, we also know um, that his predecessor, Edgar Long's predecessor, Charles Marshall, um, he died from an app burst appendix. Um, the story goes that he, there's no local doctor to care for him because he needs a local surgeon and that's not available to him as a black man in Christiansburg, Virginia in 1906. Um, and his, the surgeon who was going to help him missed the train and can come down here and he died overnight. Um, and that, I mean, that's awful. It's truly, truly awful. Um, and it really impacted people, um, especially uh, his predecessor, Edgar Long, who they did become very close friends. Um, there's a story that is also in this wonderful book um, of his writings where they basically were so dedicated to this mission of um, educating and empowering the African-Americans. Uh, they made a promise that they'd bury each other um, on CI's campus, um, which they did. Um, Unfortunately, um, you can see this is pictures of the cemetery. The cemetery, much like a lot of CI's history, has been disconnected um, and is now in a very, albeit a very nice man, but a random man's backyard, um, which we are unable to get to today. Let's see if I can get the right one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Edgar Long Cemetery Marker. There was some work done um, with Virginia Tech I think in the early thousands to beautify it, which it does look nice. Um, but you know, you can't access it. And that's always, there you go. That's the man's house in the ce cemetery. Um, so anyway, these are people who just gave everything. Oh, good. You found. Yeah. So this is, um, this is the same 
where we just saw that overhead. It's, uh, I don't know exactly what it is. Official program and souvenir book, Christiansburg Institute, um, July of 1977. So I think it's an alumni reunion, possibly. Yep. Okay. Yep. This, I believe, is their very first reunion program book. Um, first reunion that they had. So 77. Mm -hmm. So 11 years after the school closed. Um, and, and it, this is a photo of Edgar Long and Anna Patterson Long. Um, and Anna is who stayed there until basically I think three years before her death. Um, and really dedicated her life. Let's see. There's always great photos. There's, yeah, there's too. more photos too. Um, that was their speaker for the banquet, it looks like. Uh, I think he, is he a tech guy? No. Um, yeah, so Bannister, which is a family name from the Wake Forest community. Um, I know that Bannisters used to work in the president's house at Virginia Tech as part of service, not obviously Mr. Langston Bannister, but um, maybe his kin. Um, I love when they say what they did. So this is a Reverend um, H.R. Carter, um, who is a barber. Lots of barbering was a very strong history at the school. In fact, we have a new exhibit that we're releasing soon, um, highlighting that, um, and was very active in the church, um, which is a pretty common, is a, mm -hmm. an important theme. 1918 graduate. 1918. Oh, gorgeous. gorgeous, gorgeous. And was there at 77 for the, for the reunion. Oh, yeah. I mean... I've met Miss Maddie Holmes, who lives in Dublin. She's over 100 now. Um, she's married to Zedekiah Holmes, um, but she herself was a student, valedictorian, I should say. Um, yeah, there's people who have been living it. There's at least one more photo in here. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know her either, but <laughs> I'd love to read them. Let's see. She at the age of 11, she began writing her first book and finished it at the age of 13. Wow. So, very cool. Youth of the Year Award. We have so many interesting alumni. And they, in the museum, uh, we like we have original lockers that we recovered from Scattergood Hall. Mm -hmm. We're Um <laughs> And uh we like to highlight individual alumni in each one so we can explore their lives because they've lived really fascinating lives um percival Prattis, who was an editor of the chicago defender and the pittsburgh courier two really important pieces of the black press um do you want to you pulled oh, that one i get, that one. <laughs> I get so distracted So, hey, could you talk about this a little bit? Uh, what is sure. this in general? Okay, so this is um, this is a souvenir program from the Jamestown Exposition in uh, 1907. Um, and this one has been bound for library use. We have uh, another one that we could show that hasn't been bound, but... Uh, off topic, but Brew to Bean is my favorite place to, to do work at Christiansburg. Hey, off topic is fine. <laughs> um, so the Jamestown, I, I don't know the exact history of it, so let me, I'm just going to look it up. Yeah. Uh, exposition 1907. So this is a souvenir program from it. Um, I know we've got some photos of this exposition in our uh, historical photographs collection, uh, but let's see what we... This is the Encyclopedia of Virginia. Uh, helps if I have my cursor in the right spot. The Jamestown Tercentennial Exposition, marking the 300th anniversary of the founding of Jamestown and the Virginia colony by settlers from England. Uh held in Norfolk in 90, er, 1907. Um, series of fairs beginning with the 1893 Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. Okay. Uh, among many dignitaries who visited were Roosevelt, Mark Twain, Booker T. Washington. Um, so 
<laughs> Apparently there were financial problems. I'm going to skip past that. Especially interesting for the way in which it portrayed three important groups, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, and the military. Uh, okay, so I'm going to... By contrast, let's see. The African American exhibition was fairly popular. The government spent 100000 on what the Times called the two-story... Um, uh, building for African Americans. Uh, we're just gonna not say that word on stream. Um, a space for organizers to show the life of um, African American people from the days they were brought from Africa to the present. Uh, okay. So I'm. Anyway, it's it's. Um, Looks like it's like a world's fair but smaller mm -hmm. uh, and done in celebration of the 300th anniversary of the founding of jamestown virginia um so they had souvenir programs i don't specifically know why they had a montgomery county virginia souvenir program um but they did well maybe all of the counties in virginia had their own souvenir program i i don't know we have multiple copies of this um photographs it right yeah i wouldn't be surprised if each county or at least each county that was willing to print them um so, gives you a great um idea of what this area looked like at that time I, i've managed to get blurry again i think i nudged, nudged it again oh sometimes it's just the turning the page, the camera just won't adjust after. Um, Public Square in Christiansburg from, uh, oh, it's showing the Confederate monument. Yeah. It still stands there today. Um, it's in front of the Christiansburg Post Office and where the Montgomery Museum is now. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also um, three storyboards that we, Christiansburg Institute Inc. and the Montgomery Museum installed in the square. The, highlight a different part of African-American history while also acknowledging, of course, the impact slavery had in our county. Uh, take a look at Blacksburg, Blacksburg here. Um, a mountain View. This is a very mountainous area here. Yeah, lots of uh, Yellow Sulphur Springs. Ooh, really interesting story. So Yellow Sulphur Springs was actually owned by um, a group of African-American business leaders for a couple of years in the 1890s, I think, one of whom was Oscar Michaud, who we don't know a lot of, I personally don't know a lot about at least local, his local history, but he made black or films for African Americans in Roanoke, and he later kind of blew up. He became a very significant um, figure in the creation of black films and African American films. Um, yeah, so we recently how did we discover this i think we found this connection when we were digitizing the church archives of fifth avenue presbyterian church in roanoke um it's michaud it's spelled very french um m-i-c-h-e-a-u-x ah, okay i'm i'm doing a quick search <laughs> to see uh what we can possibly find out yeah, it's the uh, nom form, the historic nomination form includes it. <laughs> but we don't know a lot of history about this yet. Um, and that's, I feel like that's pretty common for um, what we do. We just keep finding these nuggets of really incredible statement of significance. Uh, eligible for the National Register under Criterion A. Oh, I was way off of my years. I'm glad we Googled this. Uh, in the ethnic heritage African American between 1926 and 1929, an African-American company operated the Hot Springs as a resort during the era of segregation. The Springs property is eligible at the state level as it served as a vacation destination for African-Americans across the state and was possibly the largest African-American-owned resort in the nation at the time. The extant buildings of the area, era at the Springs stand as examples of resort accommodations that African-Americans in Virginia built for themselves during the time of Jim Crow. Oh, that's neat. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's so much little tidbits that I really could. You could dive in and work for six months on it. I have knocked over the fan. <laughs> I have under the table. It's fine. Uh, 
Okay. So, short lived, uh, okay. but just go back to the document. Uh, so that is the spring in this photograph. So this would have been taken before. Um, <laughs> um anyway, uh we, we don't have to look at every page, but at the very back. Um, there is a description of the Christiansburg Industrial Institute written by Edgar Long, the acting principal in 1907. Mm -hmm. Did you, you said this is 1907? Yes. So this would have been the year after Charles Marshall died, which is why he's known as acting. Yeah. So history of the school started as a primary school shortly after the Civil War. Like we said. Um, so by 1907, the school comprises a farm of 185 acres, two schoolhouses, trades building, dormitory, so they only had the boys' dormitory at this point, um, the barn, the teachers' cottages, outbuildings, tools, and all the things worth about $35,000, um, and about 200 students, of which 50 were boarders. Um, and it's kind of a difficult number to get at, too, because a lot of family, or a lot of students who didn't necessarily live here might have had family in town or um, they had arrangements where they basically were living um, help for some families mm -hmm. and they would, you know, basically work for their board and then attend the school. Um, so industry was being taught in 1907, include farming, so dairy, raising chickens, carpentry, printing, shoe mending, sewing, cooking, laundry, millinery, um, making their own hats. That was a big thing too. <laughs> um, so millinery is making women's hats. I believe so. And haberdashery is men's hat. I think that's weird. It's weird that there are <laughs> two different terms. Yeah, our heads are so different. Gosh. Um, and then here's a statement about the teachers. Uh, teachers are employed mostly from Hampton or Tuskegee, so Hampton Institute in Hampton, Virginia. Um, and are passing on to the community the spirit and teachings of those great institutions. So they really cared about that association too. Um, in fact, there's a great um, preface in here, or um, not preface, but story in here that Edgar Long wrote about the first Thanksgiving, speaking about um, the farm and how they raise things. And he's a very funny writer, which is why I think I love it so much. Um, he has another great one where he um, he originally came to CI. Oh, here's the statistics I was talking about earlier about health data. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so information about the hospital. Um, Perhaps nothing better marks the progress of a people than the provisions it makes to care for its sick. We've heard it probably a couple different times from many people, but um, it's so true. Um, other exciting firsts. Um, let's see. Our first complete meal. Okay. Um, and we have the originals um, at our museum and also on our digital archive. But um, doo -doo -doo. Here, last paragraph. No, we do not employ a cook. Everything prepared here was done by students under the direction of the matron, the matron being Anna Long. Um, to be sure, some of the students or some of the women teachers helped today, but they worked mostly with the thrills. The substantials were done by the students. Uh, and how is it furnished? Da da da. We had two kinds of meat: fresh pork and turkey. Uh, by the way, not which those students go for first. He makes a joke that African Americans like the pork better than the turkey, at least at the school. Um, they killed the hog the day before. Uh, they raised the potatoes, the tomatoes, the cornbread. They grew their own corn. They spun their own meal. You know, just everything was done at the school. It's just so self-sufficient. So is, um, are these writings, do we have photocopies of those? I, interesting. No, we might actually. <laughs> if we do, and they're handwritten, I would love to, to show them. I just don't know if, if they're in there. 
yep. <laughs> You've got photocopies. Oh, great. These are good photocopies, too. Um, well, you're playing that. I was going to show, since we just looked at a um, historic place application, uh, we have from the Richard B. Dickinson papers, um, U.S. Department of Interior copy of CI's Register of, of Historic Places from 1980. So this is, let's see, June 19th, 1980. Uh, addressed to Richard Dickinson, who I'm not 100% certain who he is. I might have to pull up. I'm going to just uh, grab the finding aid so I can get a... Um, a real answer? That's <laughs> a biographical note, hopefully. Uh, 201043. Uh, community activist and historian, born in New Jersey in 1930, served with the U.S. Army in Korea, BA in geography from Michigan State. Masters of Ed from Springfield College in Massachusetts, taught at a variety of colleges and universities throughout his career, including Virginia Tech, where he researched local African-American history and, ge and genealogy. Um, so that's why he would have uh, something like this. But uh, thank you for your letter of May 19, 1980, concerning the old Christiansburg Industrial Institute, Montgomery County, Virginia, and other properties listed in the National Register of Historic Places Associated with Black History. Uh, old Christiansburg Industrial Institute was listed in the National Register on April 6, 1979. Um, the National Register does not compile a listing of National Register properties associated with Black history. However, 13 sites associated with the history of Black people uh, have been selected as National Historic Landmarks. Uh, this is, of course, in 1980. Uh, there are definitely more now. Um, so, uh, encloses a copy of the nomination form. So that's what I wanted to to find. Interesting to see that number, I guess, being kind of defended almost, because it's still a problem today. Um, not my statistic, obviously, but um, I think it's only 2% of um, places on the historic registry represent the experiences of African-Americans. Um, and, you know, that's a matter of where we're deciding to put our money. Um, and looking to see if we actually have because we have the letter, but I have yet to find the actual, like, aha. There you go. It's like, where's the actual form that it says is enclosed? Uh, now I'm just trying to find the front page of it. Okay, I found it. Uh, it's a copy of it, but... It should give us some good information. And if anyone's interested, these are all available online too, publicly available. Uh, so the, the preferred name they gave it was Old Christiansburg Industrial Institute. Mm -hmm. And or common name of uh, Hill School, Schaefer Memorial Baptist Church. Um, and 16-bit Eric, Hello, welcome in, uh, Whimsies. Welcome everybody from 16-Bit Eric's stream. Um, welcome to Archival Adventures. Uh, you're rating in on my channel, uh, twitch.tv slash rogan27. Um, and this is my weekly show where I look at things from the archives. Today I'm joined by uh, curator Jenny from the Christiansburg Institute, and we're looking at the history of um, a school that was uh, founded in 1866 uh, for um, uh, Black students here in Southwest Virginia and um, honestly had turned out so many well-known people and just so many people went through this school. It is, it is a landmark in, in uh, Black history for the U.S., if not just, like, not just the region, but nationally at least. Um, and yes, if you're here watching and you're not following 16-Bit Eric, I encourage you to do so. Uh, his streams are 
tons of fun, very informative. He's a great uh, storyteller and uh, it's a wonderful community over there. So thank you very much for the raid. Um, hello, everybody who's joining from Eric's stream. Um, it is good to see Pretty Witchery and Blue Rooster and, uh, and, and Bit Rebellious. Welcome in and welcome to everybody else who joined. Uh, feel free to ask questions um, or comment on the things that we are looking at. Uh, right now I have... Um, yeah, the historical, <laughs> the nom form, or nomination form for the National Registry of Historic Places for uh, the Hill School or what they called then as Old Christiansburg Industrial Institute. So this is the building that they um, occupied before they moved to the park campus. And it still exists and operates as a community center and an active church today. Uh, okay. So I just wanna see what, I want, I want their argument for why there's a significant statement somewhere. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. There we go, statement ah. of significance. <laughs> oh. Hi, Shadows of Life. Uh, okay. The Christiansburg Industrial Institute and the Schaefer Memorial Baptist Church are moments in the social, educational, and religious history of the Black community of Southwestern Virginia. Through the early efforts of Captain Charles S. Schaefer, the founder of the Institute, uh, the Black people of Montgomery County were able to receive educational and technical skills. It is from this instruction provided at the school and encouraged by the Memorial Baptist Church that the Christiansburg uh, Black population has contributed significantly to the ranks of leadership in Montgomery County. The history of the Christiansburg Industrial Institute began in 1866 when a Freedmen's Bureau school first opened in Montgomery County. During the Reconstruction period, separate schools for Black people and white people were established in the Christiansburg area uh, as elsewhere. Founded by Captain Charles S. Schaefer, a Freedmen's Bureau agent, a private school for primary aged African Americans uh, was established five years before the public school system became a reality. Both academic and religious training were emphasized during most of Schaefer's 30-year affiliation. Uh, not long after organizing a class for the freedmen in 1866, Captain Schaefer, later an ordained Baptist minister, formally opened the Christiansburg African Baptist Church. Uh, the meeting house was used jointly for church and school purposes. The Sunday school enrollment ex exceeded the day school membership, uh, with some teachers also teaching Bible classes at night. The combination frame structure built in 1867, served as an elementary schoolhouse uh, with uh, African-American Baptists using it for a meeting house on nights and weekends. In 1869, an addition was built. Uh, by this time, students were attending the school from long distances, having arranged board, quote, in the poor cabins of the neighborhood, unquote, or at Captain Schaefer's home. Uh, Schaefer supervised the building of the first house for normal school purposes, normal school, um, uh, that's what teachers' schools were called. Um, so a normal school was teaching teachers. Uh, by 1885, the structure was outgrown and a new schoolhouse, the Hill School, was built along with the Memorial Church and an add annex was added in 88. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, oh, a little bit more here. Yeah. Uh, from 1953 to 1967, uh, the Young People's Christian Association, um, I suppose that would be a combination of both the YMCA and YWCA. Oh, that's a good guess. I, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> used the old Hill School building for the purposes of Christian education and supervised recreation for young people in the community. After 1967, the trustees of the Schaefer Memorial Baptist Church leased the structure to the Christiansburg Community Center, who in turn subleased uh, the New River Community, oh, subleased it to New River Community Action, which is still um, in existence and operating. Uh, the building is still used as a community center. Um, continues to function as a Baptist meeting house, retaining all of its original fabric, including chancel furniture, pews, and baptistry. Uh, a memorial plaque and portrait of Captain Schaefer hangs on either side of the chancel. 
interesting. So that's part of its application for um, uh, designation as a historic place. And we can <laughs> point out, so it mentions the very first location. Um, Surprisingly gender inclusive. Yeah, key squared. <laughs> um, so the first iteration, um, before I was in the Hill School, before I was in um, a separate building, um, it was started in Nancy Campbell, who was um, a woman who was an African American woman who was free before the Civil War and emancipation. Campbells were a family in Christiansburg, an African American family, um, some of whom were enslaved on nearby plantations and farms, um, others who were free and lived as such in Cambria. Um, Nancy herself was free. She worked as a laundress and a seamstress and did well enough that she was able to purchase her own house, this one, and um, employ her daughter, too. Um, and because when Charles Schaefer first arrived in 1865, like I said earlier, no one wanted, uh, local white people did not want to work with them. So he had to turn towards the African-American community for resources. So he found Nancy Campbell, who offered to let him use a room in her house. So within a year, over 200 students were coming. And obviously, they were not fitting into this one little room. <laughs> um, these were adults and children, like we already mentioned, uh, coming when they can, when, you know, they were allowed. Basically, they had the time because they were also trying to create an entirely new life for themselves after being recently emancipated and having to deal with sharecropping and um, reconstruction, limiting laws. Um, was it, uh, were women included from the beginning or? Uh, as students? Yeah. Yes. So women could attend from the beginning, um, though their course of study was dependent right. on that. So I don't know if it mattered so much early on because it was a very traditional um, reading, writing, and arithmetic mm -hmm. with um, kind of a biblical focus as well. Um, but when um, the industrial skills are introduced, it definitely becomes a lot more gendered in terms of what students could go to. Mm -hmm. Miss Alexis Johnson, who is the alum, who's hanging around today, um, she has a great story, well, depending on your outlook. Uh, she was given... Um, all boys classes on her very first day when she showed up at school so instead of being able to take you know uh i think she was supposed to be in cosmetology and sewing they put her in shop and she's like i would love to be in shop instead no interest in <laughs> this but she had to go to the principal and oh. explain and you know they fixed it immediately because there was no fluidity there whatsoever of um course. in fact um edgar the edgar a. long building which yeah, Edgar A. Long Building has um, two photograph or two doors on either side of it, um, and one was the boys' door, uh, door, and the other was the girls' door, and it corresponded to which side their gen their dormitories were. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's always challenging when you talk about this because, of course, there were queer people who attended CI. There's oh, of course, uh, you know, but they're not represented in the archives. Um, okay, I was about to ask if you had any any documentation of it no the close no, the no only... I, honestly i'm not surprised by that answer just because like i work with um uh, queer archival material and 99 percent of it is white and 80 mm -hmm. percent of it is male yeah I, i'm so. only chuckling because really the only i mean you know it's easy to get stories especially from um older men in particular about like you know dating stories and things never heard anything yeah like um crossed over there uh in fact really the only primary sources i think we've ever found in the archive that allude to anyone's sexuality is an envelope full of pornography that was sealed and in a student's file um it was the day we were really excited when we found that <laughs> yeah but um yeah. the uh Pornography is an interesting and delicate topic within archives. Um, it is collected sometimes, and uh, sometimes very important. Like um, I would say, especially within queer history, uh, is where you'll find uh, pornography sort of uh, most within archives, and 
Um, yeah. If you yeah. want to know more about that, I encourage you to visit the um, uh, the website of the uh, Leather Archives and Museum uh, in Chicago. Okay, I'll have uh, to look into that. <laughs> honestly, we found it in an envelope labeled confiscated, and we thought, well, I'm not going to digitize that, I guess. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting, yeah, it's a really interesting uh, question. But also, I mean, not, we don't have to spell pornography. I'm not, yeah, but, I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to show this one on stream, but I'll drop the yeah. link in. Okay. Yeah. I just have to find their website. Um, you know, it's just like they're teenage people. Of course. Yeah. There's something like that in student files that got confiscated. Um, yeah. So. Well, their website apparently does not want to work right now. Okay. But that's fine. Yeah. Um, I can point you all to where it exists and you're free to explore it in your own time. Uh, but it, you can keep going. I will. Sure. Oh man, I don't think I grew long in Booker T. Washington and Robert Moton would have enjoyed their pictures being up during that part. <laughs> oh well. Um, Apology. Apologies to these gentlemen. Um, so this is a group shot of Edgar Long with Booker T. Washington and then uh, Moton, his Booker T. Washington successor, and on KCI's campus. Um, so this is not when he came to speak initially. This was taken at a different time, though I don't know the year. This is, um, it's a little blurry, but I think it's a great photo. So it's worth sharing. Um, we have the original in our archives, but um, it's the day of his funeral, um, Edgar Long's funeral in 1927. You can see the mourners have gathered in front of Bailey Morris Hall. Um, and here is a photograph of his um, headstone and such, um, which, you know, we uh, take care of the cemetery today. And so does the man who, house backs into it we're actually really fortunate that a nice person lives there um but i also find this interesting because you can see um the land the farm um and the crops really back up right onto the cemetery mm -hmm. um showing that they really were using as much space as they possibly could i'm just looking to see if it's in the digitized stuff oh yeah right there Because, yeah, it's it's hard to see it in the photocopy that we have, but uh, this is the, the scan that was done of your original. Yeah. So, um, his widow, Anna, is in the center as well, as, well as other teachers um, and his family members. He raised his whole family on campus. Um, we are still connected with the long descendants. Um, and, work with them to you know preserve their memory of their family because it's their fa their family history is so interconnected to our institutional history um we want to make sure that we're being respectful um always i was trying to zoom it's not working <laughs> i don't i don't know how to do it with the, the mouse and with the touchpad i could but <laughs> yeah with the mouse i i actually have no idea how uh anyway um, that's good. Yeah, beautiful photo. Um, I mean, sad photo, but beautiful too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just like their hats. It's another the Alexander mm -hmm. sisters, Viola, Elizabeth, Harriet. Well, apparently, um, people were learning millinery. They might have made their hats. It's a very good possibility. Um, and that's another family that lived in Christiansburg or Cambria. For a very long time um in fact one of our interns did a pretty deep dive on their family because there's a lot of, they're very connected to um a lot of educators who came through mm -hmm. ci um, so audrey whitlock is edgar a long's um daughter one of them at least um she and her sister narissa were both um poets playwrights musicians audrey taught piano in roanoke um so this is this is audrey i believe that is audrey yeah okay. um and yeah that's her photo behind her. um and she's actually part of the reason why we went to fifth avenue presbyterian church um she's passed on but she was the church organist at fifth avenue presbyterian in roanoke um and we worked with our church um historian to digitize their work because of 
like we said, it's so connected. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, a nice original filter. Yeah. Inside. Where is the scrub? What is the? This looks. I've never actually seen this before. Um, this was what? compiled by Amanda Dehart who um, she taught cosmetology at Christiansburg Institute, and she also attended herself. Was this in a, she, a folder, or was this one of the things? That came from this folder, which came from Box 2. Ah, OK. Is that right? Yes. Um, and Amanda also wrote, along with um, James, it's hard to see, but um, sometimes if you put it at an angle, it'll it'll work a little better with the lighting. But so, so it's called um, a proud heritage. Uh, Christians were against a proud heritage, and it was written by Amanda D. Hart and James Smith, who was a Virginia State professor of history. Um, and it's a really good, quick history of CI. Oh, you guys have great photographs on here too. So you kind of see. Like the inside of the carpentry shop, um, farm operations. So this book is out of print, but um, is available through the um, through the library, I believe. I was trying to find it. Uh, It might be Christian's book uh, I'll find out here. Okay. Um, so this is a really important photo too. Um, I feel like we're jumping all over the place, so uh, I appreciate that. That is, that's how this goes. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, so when they moved to the farm campus, um, there, it was basically um, an old, we could call it a plantation. It wasn't nearly as big as something like Kentland or the nearest local plantation or Smithfield. Um, had about 14 enslaved individuals in 1860 on the slave census. Um, and we believe after the Civil War, the family um, didn't have as much money and they had to sell the farm. Also, it seemed, according to notes from um, Long and Marshall, that they'd kind of um, dried out the land pretty badly. So it wasn't as productive. So they sold the land um, and all of that exists is what the um, people at CI, the first teachers called the mansion house. I don't know if that's language original to the people who owned it beforehand or not, but so they called it the mansion house. And you can't see in this photo, but behind it are three cabins for the enslaved. Um, and we have a photo of that in our museum, but um, the very first boarding students, the male boarding students had to sleep in these cabins um, because there was no other place for them. And the mansion house served as the classroom building and um, the principal and his family lived upstairs, um, which is why it was so important that they then build Morris Hall, that uh, boys dormitory, eh, it's grainy, but um, that Booker T. Washington spoke in front of in 1903 mm -hmm. because that got those kids out of the slave cabin, which um, was a when they trans or, um, transitioned CI from a normal school into an industrial school, a lot of the local African-American community members had a gut reaction or initial reaction um, that, why are you sending us back to the field mm. in a lot of ways? This is something that we've read in um, their response and um, those CI um, early teachers uh, had to really prove the concepts to get buy-in from the local African-American community. Um, so things like making sure that students weren't sleeping in, in old slave cabins were very, very important. I was looking for a Morris Hall image on your digitized stuff, but I only get the women's one. That sounds more like a I'm not going to say a metadata issue. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get a, an email from my metadata person. <laughs> but, um, nope. Uh, let's see. Maybe I can find another. This is a beautiful photograph. I mean, we, we saw the picture earlier. I was just going to 
bring it up digitally if I could, but... This one is so great. So this looks like 1924, and the style is incredible. I haven't seen this one before. Um, yeah, you can really see like the influence of kind of the flapper style. Yeah. Kind of leaking in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Look at the canes, the white. This is probably the fanciest dress I've ever seen. Senior class, junior, senior banquet. Yeah. So, you know, like we said, there was always a thriving social life at CI. Um, just that was, you know, the community was always part of it. Um, I love it. But I'm going to have to get you guys to it. I wish, I wish that uh, it wasn't as blurry on camera but that has more to do with um how much i'm zooming <laughs> and and the fact that this is it's it's a different kind of zoom now i can zoom in this way and it won't be blurry. oh look at that yeah it has the a man macro dead lens. center posing i mean yeah it's a good camera it has a macro lens i just have to physically move it closer in order to to zoom in with lots of detail. Um, zooming in digitally <laughs> ends up a little blurry sometimes. Sure. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna show this real quick. This because I found it. And it's an amazing photo oh, with God. all of the people here at this is um, Bailey Morris Hall. So mm -hmm. explain Morris Hall and Bailey Morris Hall. Like one's the men's Storm and one is Women's Storm, but they both have Morris in the name. Yes. Uh, why? That's unusual. Yes. So <laughs> the buildings on CI's campus, the substantial ones, were all named after Quakers who were part of the Friends Freedmen's Bureau. Bailey kind of gets double names. Um, he was instrumental in a lot of fundraising. Mm -hmm. Scattered Dead Hall, which was the gymnasium built in 54. Um, that was named after Henry Scattergood, who was the treasurer for almost 50 years. Very supportive. Um, in fact, the Edgar A. Long building is the only building on CI's campus that was named after an African American. Um, so we always like to point to that. Um, but yeah, so the other folks that the buildings are named after were instrumental in a lot of fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But so uh, it's the same person that both storms are named after? Yes, I believe it's Joshua Bailey and then Joshua Bailey, Joshua Bailey and then William Morris, I believe. Okay. That's his name. And they were both part yeah, of the FFA or the Friends Freedmen's Association. Um, and it wasn't, what was really kind of incredible about the FFA is while they did have managerial oversight, um, they, because of the distance between Philadelphia and um, Christiansburg, which is, I mean, anyone who lives here today still knows it's not easy to get here. It's especially not yeah. easy to get here if you don't have a car. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it allowed a lot of autonomy for the African-American teachers to really shape and mold the school how they would like it. Um, which I think is what part of what helps make CI so unique. Um, this is a, a faculty picture um, to the right. We have Abraham Walker, who was the last Tuskegee trained principal, um, and some other teachers who I can't identify from the 40s. Well, I um, mean, but they look dapper. <laughs> it's a photograph labeled at the top. Can you identify these persons? <laughs> uh, because that is a thing that happens in archives. You get lots of photos, and so rarely do they mm -hmm. actually have identifying information either with them or on the back or uh, sometimes it'll may have a vague thing about uh the year or somebody's first name or possibly a, a, a brief note like a shorthand about what the event was or something like that um, but a lot of times there's just nothing yeah it's so true which is why it is such an incredible asset to us um that we have community members, CI alumni and their kids who come in and can just sit down with a scrapbook for a couple hours and just go, oh yeah, oh yeah, I know him, I know her. Oh, yeah. I flirted with her. She was too tall for me. I heard that one lately. Um, <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm 5'8", but whatever. Um, you know, and 
it's that it's that community piece that makes our community archive i think special mm -hmm. because otherwise you know this is what who we try to do it for primarily i think it's really important for historical research and collective knowledge but also this is the history of the community and it's their history and i'm mm -hmm. just lucky enough that i get to touch it um, let's see dr sydney walker from the class of Okay. Two. I love playing guessing games with archives. Yeah. yeah. Also, key squared. I agree. This material is very cool. Yeah. Uh, here's the Calfi Junior Pioneer. Got a copy. It's very yeah, stressful. I can give you some foam oh, to put under that side if you want. There we go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, um, and. This is a great example. So CII, so Calfi was a Peter's school, like um, Anthony said. Um, so was the Hill School after it trans uh, stopped being the main um, building for CI. Um, I always love, there's so many fun things in here. So talk about what colleges students are going to, which I think is really incredible for 1945. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna zoom in. Sure. Hopefully, and, and it's short, so I'm going to try and just read it. Absolutely. October 1945. No, I'm going to need to zoom in manually. Among the former Calfi students being found in college halls this fall are Dorcas Johnson at Virginia State, James Mills at Morgan College, Fred Thomas, Irene Holt, Rebecca Thomas, Ruby Martin at Morristown College. Sorry, uh, I'm trying to hold it steady, but yeah. Uh, Ruby Martin and Virginia Martin and Annie Mills of A&T College. I don't know what that is. It might be North Carolina A&T. Uh, there's several a I can see. I, yeah. Uh, Walter McClinahan of West Virginia State. Letitia Raspi of Clark University, Annabelle Harmon at the Tuskegee Institute. Cool. Uh, I'm going to see what I can learn about A&T College because we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what I find. I... Yeah, so we had um, one alum, if it's North Carolina A&T College, which it might not be. Um, Charles Ellsworth Stigger. He was a CI um, alum. He played on the football team um, at the time when everyone um, really knew the football team and loved it. Uh, they raised, they went undefeated for an entire season. Um, so he got a scholarship through uh, Coach Tillman Cease at um, North Carolina a &T, and that put him right in Greensboro during the sit-ins. And he was actually roommates with those. It's Greens probably Four. North Carolina A&T. They're all of the top results, and they are an HBCU. Um, what does A&T stand for? Agriculture and Technical. Ah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Agricultural and Technical, yeah. Sterling, thank you for the follow. <laughs> Somehow you accidentally unfollowed the channel. Hey, I, I will accept the refollow. Um. Um, following, I... The chaos uh, of, out, oh, it's okay. Um, so also talking about um, how CI and these other schools were centers for the community. Um, they were also um, center places for these county leagues, which were um, organizations of African-American community members who met and um, advocated on behalf of their children and their school and mm -hmm. citizenship, um, different, uh, counties from definitely across Virginia, and I think it was across the country, um, created these things. So there was a Montgomery County League. Uh, it looks like they merged um, with Pulaski. Um, and that's actually how CI got the very first school bus. It was in 1930s, and that's it was raised by the African American community. Um, mm -hmm. So when we say, you know, we're trying to expand the narrative to really include these stories that really show how um, active. The community was in creating education for their kids and themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. That reminds me. Um, so next week, 
<laughs> Next week, Sterling's actually going to join the show with me, and we're going to be looking at some BT queer history. Um, and so remind me next week, but there's documentation that I have that shows that it was the um, LGBT student group on campus uh, in sometime in the 80s, uh, but that raised money to put bus shelters up for Blacksburg Transit. That is so interesting. And who would have known? I wish I did. I'm glad I do now. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to tell everybody I need this. <laughs> like, I don't think that they put up all the bus shelters, but like the that student organization specifically mm -hmm. was raising money to build bus shelters for the the college um, bus system. Wow, that is so cool. <laughs> yeah, so that's how a lot of things were at the DI. If they wanted something, they had to fundraise. So if they wanted an organ, they did that. Um, there was a lot of cooperation, uh, or there was some cooperation, should they, uh, with other institutions. So like the football uniforms that they wore, they got from Virginia Tech. They were hand-me-downs from the football team. Um, things like that. This is the greatest cosmetology club. Um, you see all the fantastic hair, 1964. So. This is a really, really good book. This is a really good book. <laughs> I'm actually going to take it. No, I'm not. I'm allowed to leave. It's okay. <laughs> um, but I absolutely if um if you don't have a copy of this we can definitely arrange to get it digitized so that it can go into the online collection i would absolutely love that especially to curl or not to so right now we're creating an exhibit called uh, reflections in beauty cosmetology and barbering at christians brigham institute uh, it's a new exhibit funded through the virginia humanities that explores black beauty culture um at ci and you know there's so many different ways to get at it. Um, so uh, I'm going to read it. Okay. Um, beauty may be many things. A smile, your voice, your eyes, your walk, your graceful ways and charm. Cultivating beauty begins at the grassroots of the total being. Take a simple curl, for instance. By itself, there is much to be desired. Many curls molded into a beautiful coiffure is an art. Much time and styling are necessary to achieve the desired effect of enhancing existing facial features. To cultivate an illusion of individualism, those distinctive qualities that make girls feminine are attract er, and attractive are essential. Looking into history a few thousand years back, we find young Roman girls with profuse curls. Irons were used to create the effect. Men and women gave much attention to their habits of beautification costly wigs, perfume, and cosmetics were compounded by barbers for the wealthy class. If you want the facts, read The History of Hair by Anne Charles. Women never laid the cornerstone nor paved the way for beauty. Our masculine competitors loaned us the idea and taught us the manipulative skills to acquire what men like in women, the soft look. Uh, physically, mentally, and socially. Uh, kinds of curls. Uh, sculptured, pinned. Uh, Croconold. Heated iron. So that's like a double iron. I only uh, recently learned this. A heated <laughs> iron invented by Michel Grotteau. C-R-O-Q-U-I-G-N-O-L-E-D. I'm doing my best. Croconold. That's the best I, I, idea I have of how to say it. Natural, given by nature. Magnetic, commercial made, rolled. Split paper, kid, steam, permanent, brush, drop, corkscrew. Uh, the choice is yours to curl or not. As stated before, to attract, you must have something to look at. Uh, attention getter. How you accompany the desired look may come from experience or hard labor. In curling, that is. Wearing rollers to school, shopping, and to work is taboo. Taboo. A very distasteful habit of those who are careless. A cheap wig is better to cover up with than the ugly side effects. Rollers were meant for the salon and quick sets at home. A girl of pride would not be caught in public without the right decorum. 
prepared by Mrs. Amanda DeHart, cosmetology instructor. Um, Amanda would have a lot of thoughts about my life. <laughs> I love that. Um, it, it reminds me of, uh, oh gosh, I can't even remember now whether it was last year or the year before. Um, or possibly the year before that. I don't remember. But we looked at um, historical volumes of uh, the Ladies Home Journal and ran across a series of articles analyzing uh, women's hair. Um, and it was full of lots of very wrong information about um, <clears throat> ideas on uh, environment and race as it related to hair and hair type. It was fascinating <laughs> and and very racist. <laughs> was it a white author? author oh yeah, you absolutely. Know? Okay. It, was, it was like uh, 1920s, 1930s <laughs> Ladies Home Journal. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, this is something I, you know, as a curator, especially as a white person in this space, like, I don't know a lot about. So we've been working with um, a descendant, Christine King, who um, is very involved. Uh, she's a board member um, and a descendant of many alumni and trained cosmetologists. So she's been helping us create the exhibit. We're having these, um, we're using a lot of the images from our archives and recreating historic beauty styles to kind of be more kid friendly and interactive but it's been such an interesting thing to explore because beauty is an iceberg that is very deep underneath like, there's so many topics you could touch upon this this article it's i i love running across things like this because she was a cosmetology instructor but this article to me especially toward the end it felt like uh reading like miss manners or something like that like um which would have been like the the white girl's like proper behavior guide. I can't remember exactly the name of the authors or whatnot, but but like it reminds me of that in, in yeah. sort of the approach, especially toward the end where it's talking about that it is taboo to to go out in public wearing curlers. The yes, I mean. This is alumni can speak to it infinitely better than me, but the respectability elements involved and being a student or a teacher at CA, is, you had it was a straight and narrow path. Um, people were expelled. <laughs> I, well, and uh, that makes sense, especially during during that era. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's actually multiple eras that the school was open, but but. Um, the extra pressure yeah. within any minoritized group to be respectable, mm -hmm. to be non-offensive in order to um, best represent the entirety of that group um, when we're all individuals and we're all different. And but, but every individual in a minority is treated as though they're a monolith that represents the entire minority. Absolutely. Yeah, you see that throughout all time or all the time of his CI's history. Yeah. Um, there's this, I wish I had it in front of me, um, this incredible description of CI graduates in like 1909 or something um, that Edgar Long writes. And he, you could tell this just, this kid bugged him or something. Because he's writing about all the graduates and what they're going to do. And he's like, and this guy with his gaily colored socks. Because uh, <laughs> they're colorful. He basically is criticizing his fashion choices and ends it by saying, well, hopefully he grows out of it. Um, and, you know, it's... And this is coming from a man, though, who... he When he traveled up north with uh, Charles Marshall, who was lighter skinned, um, he... In his own words, that's it. He had to play the the N word, um, and this Charles Marshall could pass, and he couldn't. So, you know, they were operating under a completely different set of rules. Um, and by 1950, when this is probably about when this is written, 40 to 50. I mean, the world's different, but that's not that's not long ago. Um, this word asked, is the new exhibit going to have an online presence too? Uh, yeah, so we're going to put the videos that we're filming online. So we have a YouTube page. Um, 
and hopefully we will do a digital exhibit too. That's sort of time dependent though. It's a, yeah, but um, we would absolutely, we could always do like a virtual tour too if someone's interested. Uh, okay, this is the YouTube channel. Yes, and this uh, is a great time, if not now, maybe in the next two weeks. We're putting, um, we're getting ready to put all of our audio visual materials on our YouTube from our archives. So you can hear directly from alum oral histories, um, videos. There's, um, if you pull it up uh, or just look at our YouTube page, the Blue Ridge Excursions, that is um, a video I'm of Miss Elaine Dow. Gonna stick it over here so I can show it to them. Perfect. So, Miss um, Elaine Dow Carter um, was the very first, um, cause, I'm sorry, director, executive director of Christiansburg Institute, Inc. Um, when it was founded in 2000. Um, uh, yeah, so any of uh, this photo or this right there, um, that's Miss Elaine Dow with Miss Jacqueline Eaves, who was the CI Alumni Association president. Um, so you can hear the history rather than from me. Um, you can hear it directly from the alum who lived it. Um, and also they talk a bit more about um, the process of what, of trying to restore that great long building and preserve their history. American in Virginia so, could legally attend from a, prior to the Civil you can't beat that from a directly impacted in 1831, making it a crime to hold school for any black, slave or free. While that law died with the end of slavery, African Americans hungry yes. for formal education I still faced monumental hear. obstacles uh, for the next 100 years. It might be I'm Sarah quiet. McConnell. Today on With Good Reason, we'll talk about the so, history of public education yeah. for blacks yeah, so and Virginia. Yeah, so we things like that. We're working to get some of the oral histories um, that we've gathered also available online. Just really increasing access. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, we have actually reached 4th. 30. We're a couple of minutes over 4.30, so we should probably wind up. Is there anything else you particularly really want to show before we end? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love a captive audience. Oh, we can end here. Isn't this great? Oh, my gosh. Girls Gym Class. Um, 1966. 1966, the very last year that CI was opened. Um, you see them posing, and don't they, they just look so so happy to be there. Mm -hmm. I, it's just a wonderful photo. So I just encourage y'all to explore more of CI's history in your own time. It's a really important local history with national and sometimes even global impact. Um, and also the alumni who came through, um, whether they graduated or not, because not everyone got to graduate, um, they made incredible change in the world. Um, so yeah, just it's worth Um, well, I guess we should wind up. <laughs> this was a lot of fun and, um, very informative. Like I had not spent a ton of time, uh, with these materials and, and it's great having you here to really explain them. This is, it's a lot of fun. Usually I'm left to guess and try to look things up. Um, but you know the history, and so that was very, very interesting. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to have been here. Thanks for following along with my chaos brain. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, this broadcast, uh, of course, it'll be available right away as um, a highlight or a, as a, a VOD on the Twitch channels. Um, it should be on the library's YouTube channel. Um, by Friday, assuming that I don't get waylaid by some other massively like urgent thing. Um, but uh, I didn't know you had a, a YouTube channel. I can also send you um, the info and, and the video if you wanted to put it up on your channel. Sure. Um, yeah. Great. <laughs> more places, Absolutely. more exposure. Um, so the question is, where do we want to go uh, for our raid? Um, usual suspects. Let's see. 
uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium is on. I'm. This light is just getting in my way of seeing things. Um, they have shark cam today. Um, there is always, of course, Stephen Joyce, uh, who we often go to. <laughs> Playing Hell Divers too, apparently. Um, I love sharks. Yeah, shark cam it is then. Okay. Uh, we can, we'll head on over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, it's always a lovely, relaxing stream. Uh, and just gonna set up <laughs> to do the double raid. Um, of course, next week on Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time, I will be live once more with more from the archives and um, at that time, I will be joined, as I said, by Sterling, uh, who has been picking the topics for the past few uh, months. And um, we're going to be looking at materials related to queer history here at Virginia Tech. Um, this week is uh, Pride Week here on campus. Um, and so we'll be, you know, tagging in at the very end of that, right after everything is done, uh, we're going to look at some VT queer history. So hopefully I will see a bunch of you next week um, to explore that topic with, uh, with Sterling and myself. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jenny. Um, any quick words that you want to say about um, CI or should people follow you? Should people follow oh, socials for Don't the eye me. or anything? Um, yeah, <laughs> only if you want to see my dog, follow me. Um, but yeah, we are on Christiansburg Institute on Facebook and Instagram. Um, let's see, catalog, it's where we host our digital archive. And in the next couple of months, you'll be able to see um, our the digital images on Virginia Tech's digital uh, library. Awesome. Uh, well, Thanks for joining everybody. Until I see you next, um, keep exploring history.